Hello film fans and welcome to this episode of The Sherlockian. Now today marked the final episode of Apple TV's Prehistoric Planet, but was it any good? Well, on today's episode we look at potholing Triceratops, dancing dinos and Gendrosaurus. First of all, the Triceratops then. Well, Triceratops really are quite common in dinosaur documentaries, aren't they? I mean, there scarcely goes a dinosaur documentary that doesn't have them. They're one of the most recognisable dinosaurs in existence. I often think part of their appeal is that they look quite a lot like rhinos. And indeed, in dinosaur programmes, they often act quite a lot like rhinos as well. You know, charging around, you know, stabbing things with their horns. But Prehistoric Planet, as you might expect, does something a little bit different with them. For a start, it focuses on baby Triceratops, which is something that you don't always see, but more importantly, it looks at some of their behaviour. Now, it's a well-known fact in some modern mammals, particularly things like um, the larger herbivores. Obviously, they eat plants in um, their forest environments that frequently have toxins in them, so they need to have some way of allaying this. And it's been noted in things like tapirs that they can often visit clay licks, which they use as essentially indigestion medicine, and it sort of coats the lining of their stomach and makes sure that they don't get poisoned. And what I liked about the sequence in Prehistoric Planet is it kind of combined um, two of my favourite sequences in Life of Mammals, which I don't know if you remember, it's um, quite a while since it came out, but it was one of my um, first documentaries I ever saw, and it's still one of my favourites. And and the episode on herbivores, it has um, two scenes I really liked, which had um, tapirs um, feeding from a clay lick in the middle of the night. It's quite sort of eerie footage. We're sort of in early kind of night vision camera mode um, where you can't quite see what's going on, but it felt quite exciting. It felt like you were actually there. And then the other thing it had was it's absolutely beautiful sequence, um, one of the best sequences I think that's ever been shown on a BBC documentary, where these um, elephants go underground to... Um, take salt off the walls using their tusks and to eat it because obviously you know they don't really get much salt through their vegetarian um, diet and this kind of combined the two it had these triceratops going underground to get to this clay lick and the little baby gets separated during the trip because obviously it's pitch dark they can't see a thing and it just felt really eerie and you really got a sense of this sort of underground environment but it's not really a place you expect to see any dinosaur particularly triceratops which you normally associate with sort of a very foresty woody environment and it was absolutely brilliant i mean and i really liked as well the variation it gave the different triceratops on their frills they weren't all exactly the same you could actually see distinctions between the two like they were actually real individual animals it's absolutely brilliant and that's why I've included it in this, um, my top three, if you like, in this review, because it was just so brilliant. You got to see a new angle on a dinosaur that you're already quite familiar with. I mean, I've no idea whether Triceratops actually did that in real life, but it seems highly likely that they must have done something in order to offset their highly vegetarian diet. Then the next thing I really enjoyed featured Carnotaurus, which is a dinosaur I'd never heard of before um, today, but it features some very interesting behaviour. Obviously, they can tell to some extent um, through the uh, organic tissue that's still left on some dinosaur so that they discover what the colour on these different dinosaurs was. And they obviously use this to their advantage in the Carnotaurus scene which shows a male Conotaurus displaying to a female and it creates its own little sort of stage, very similar to the modern um, birds like lyrebird or some uh, varieties of birds of paradise, which sort of create their own little stage for on which to display on. And then once the female Conotaurus arrives, the male displays to her and he shows off, particularly him showing off his sort of his blue arms, which sort of on the sort of inside of what would be in a human, you know, your forearm. He shows that off and sort of displays it to the female. Again, very similar to something like um, a bird of paradise might do in its display. And it's just a very interesting sequence, made all the better by Hans Zimmer's brilliant score. I mentioned in my first episode review that Hans Zimmer's score is absolutely excellent. And he really excels himself in this episode, particularly in this scene. It's just absolutely brilliant. It, he plays this really sort of upbeat kind of dance music as this Carnotaurus sort of jumps around, sort of turns and turns, and then finally displays his arms again and again and sort of rotates them using a ball and socket joint, obviously at the shoulder. And it's just absolutely brilliant. And then to cap it all, the female rejects him. So, you know, that's something. I mean, hopefully I'm sure it managed to find love later on, but you don't see that bit. 
but yeah, it's just a brilliant sequence and again, it features a dinosaur that you might not have been familiar with. I mean, I know I wasn't. And then finally, I think my favourite sequence is this entire uh, episode and probably one of my favourite sequences in the entire series as a whole. Featured, again, another dinosaur which I wasn't familiar with at all, Gengosaurus. Now, you might think, oh, Gengosaurus, that sounds a very interesting name. I wonder what that means. Well, it's actually quite dull. It means Genjo lizard. Um, Genjo is the um, place in China it was discovered. So that's not very interesting. But it may, more than makes up for it in the behaviour it shows. Basically, it's got a... Obviously, it's hunting in a forest because this episode's on forests. And it's hunting a species of sort of feathered dinosaur called Corythoraptor. And um, Corythoraptor is um, feeding in like a group on some fallen fruit that have fallen in the forest and then um, Giangiosaurus gradually sneaks up on it very close and what I really liked about it is you often get in dinosaur documentaries particularly when they talk about things like uh, Allosaurus I'll say John Hurt did this a lot particularly in his um, series um, Planet Dinosaur and he say things like you know Allosaurus is an ambush hunter you know and it has to get close to its quarry before it can strike and then it would show you a sequence where the Allosaurus seemed to run for quite a long time before it caught its prey and you sort of think is that really ambush hunting I mean modern ambush predators like say leopards they have to get incredibly close to their prey like five feet I mean that's an incredibly close distance I mean it's almost you know within like two bounds before you jumped on the quarry's back i mean that's how close they have to be that's ambush hunting in my mind at least so what i really liked about this sequence is it first of all it shows you the gendosaurus getting really really close really properly stalking and it's in a foresty environment so it really feels like it's creeping up on these um carithoraptor and then it does get incredibly close like uh, probably about you know, four or five strides before it strikes so that was brilliant and you know it takes a few attempts um, in different hunts for it to actually grab one and i just really liked it it felt very real it felt very um it felt very much like an ambush predator would actually hunt and what i liked as well is that it for the first time i think in any dinosaur program i've watched it actually felt like as well that the dinosaur had camouflage suited to its environment it obviously it's um I say it scales, it kind of has both scales and sort of, you know, downyish feathers, but it's, you know, it's plumage, if you like, was very well suited to its environment. It wasn't exactly the same, but it, you felt like it was kind of blending into the background. You could understand why the Carithoraptor couldn't see it, which is not always something you really get in dinosaur documentaries. Often it doesn't feel like the dinosaur is really camouflaged to its environment. It just sort of looks roughly the same colour as if they've gone right we're going to make the background desert so let's make this allosaurus red and then done in sort of similar colours anyway you're probably thinking oh well at least he's grown up a bit he's not talking about strange dinosaur names anymore but you'd be wrong because i found a brilliant one in this episode a trossy raptor i mean how's that escape the notice of jurassic world or whatever it's called nowadays I mean, you can understand why it wasn't in Jurassic Park, because it was only discovered in 1995. But a dinosaur called a Trociraptor, you'd think that would get in films all the time. Apparently it means Savage Robber, which is a brilliant name. It means it sounds scary. And I haven't really got anything else to add about it, apart from that. But yeah, what a great name. Anyway, that was the Shilock In. Thanks very much for watching. I do appreciate all your support over these videos. They've been quite popular by my very own modest standards. So thanks again. And hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.